welcome to today's webinar about retrofitting of your car to an electric vehicle. I will give you a short introduction for today. So about the webinar, it will be recorded. Um, we have a question and answer box. Um, please post your questions in this Q&A box. The questions can be upvoted, so if you see questions that are more relevant or more in your interest, please um, click on the thumb so these questions will handle primary. We limit this Q&A also to five minutes or five questions. Um, also depends how far we get in our, in our timeline. You all, as participants, will receive afterwards the link inclusive the presentations. Short disclaimer, um, views, findings, and publications of this webinar does not, do not necessarily represent the views or policies of the very organization or its individual participants. So, official part is done with the introduction. I'm happy to announce you as first speaker today, Andreas Hager, the CEO of Etrofit, um, located in Germany. Andreas, welcome. Thank you, Philippe. Um, um, uh, welcome all the visitors. Um, uh, I'm more than happy to be invited by Avery and um, uh, Philippe um, to have a short um, uh, webinar today. I, I normally used to walk on stages to tell something. And now I'm, um, I'm sitting in my house and, and try to, um, to have the same emotions. Um, uh, um, over over the computer and um, the World Wide Web, which I normally have in um, in conference houses. So perfect, thank you. So I will stop sharing the screen so you can take over. Okay. Yeah, if you go to full screen modes, yep. then we have. Okay. Okay, floor is yours. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Philippe. Um, so, yes, my name is um, uh, Andres. Uh, I'm the CEO of Etrofit. Um, here you can see Etrofit, the world's most sustainable and economic electrification kit for commercial vehicles. So, today we are mainly talking about uh, buses, um, even uh, the motto for today is uh, about cars. You will hear um, a little bit more from Jesper uh, than in the next round. Um, so today I will I will talk mostly about buses and the opportunity to retrofit diesel buses into electric buses um, to to be emission free in public transport. First of all, who we are. Um, Etrofit is um, providing professional electrification solutions for commercial vehicles um, uh, heavier than uh, uh, 3.5 tons. And um, our contribution is um, to reduce emissions in traffic and public transport. Um, so we belong to a, a private um, um, shareholding company and um, in 2018, we have received the German Mobility Award from the German Ministry of Transportation. And in 2019, we were awarded um, from the Busplaner. It's, um, it's a newspaper um, for the bus industry um, to receive the award of um, sustainability. But today, we are 42 people working um, at Etrofit at two locations in Germany. One is Garching, it's close to Munich, and one is Ingolstadt, very well known from the Audi company. Um, our development is in three countries um, uh, today, and our sales, it's Germany, Austria, and Italy. So, these are some numbers uh, which, uh, which are very important first. Um, so on the left side, on the top, you see that if a if a bus is born in the factory, um, sorry, if a bus is born in the factory um, during his lifetime, which is uh, 35 to 40 years, 
he will receive about three new diesel engines um, over his lifetime. And um, today we believe that this does not um, have to happen. So if it's born as a diesel, it's, um, uh, it's fine um, because maybe there were no better options in the past, but it does not have to get um, a second and a third diesel engine uh, because our actions and our policies today are different. Um, if you look below that, you see that um, in cities, 2% of the vehicles, um, they have 30% of the emissions, which is mainly um, uh, um, public transport by buses. So with a small number of vehicles, you, um, you can have huge efforts uh, um, and uh, huge benefits on um, reduction of emissions. So that's why uh, buses are the right topic to jump into. into. From a European perspective, you see that 99% of all electric buses um, being used globally are Chinese buses. So as a, as a European um, company and the European guy, um, I would say we need to provide um, uh, more and better options um, also for um, um, added value in Europe. Even the clean vehicle directive is now in place. Um, uh, you can see the um, the emissions reduction um, on the on the right side. Um, it's uh, fifteen percent minus twenty twenty five and so on. Even if we follow all um, the new uh, vehicle registrations for the clean vehicle directive, we still will have more than two hundred thousand diesel buses in twenty twenty five. So the new electric bus. Is, is an important option, but it cannot be the only one. So that's why a retrofitting is a good option. Um, if, if people ask, uh, will, will an um, um, electric bus with batteries um, strong enough for the uh, travel distance per day? Um, I would say yes. Um, most of um, city buses are traveling 200 kilometers or less a day which is absolutely no issue to receive by battery systems. Um, but I'd like to mention also fuel cell technology is something which we develop and which will be available in, um, in about uh, two years on a serious level. Um, the emission of um, city buses in Europe is quite high. It's 70,000 tons every day, which is... Um, um, very high emission, but uh, we do have emissions everywhere and, and it's too much everywhere. And the, the average age of the um, European bus fleet today is 9.4 years. Um, you can see it's uh, in, in Germany, we have about um, eight years. In, in Italy, we have um, 12 to 13 years. Um, so it's growing the more south you go um, in Europe. On this slide, you see why I talk about um, buses mostly, and not too much about trucks um, today. Um, on the left side, you see that uh, the growth of the market in buses is a lot more dynamic than on trucks today. Uh, this is because of the political pressure. Um, the uh, public transport in cities is under high pressure from the political side, so that's why we see um, uh, um, a pretty much more dynamic market here. But the trucks will follow, and they are more in numbers, which you can see on the right side. Um, uh, today, we have about um, 400,000 electric buses globally. We will have, in 10 years, um, uh, about the triple of the quantity on electric um, uh, trucks. We have today less than 200,000 but in 10 years, we will have um, more than five times of the quantity. So from a quantity perspective, um, the trucks are, um, are more than buses, but from a market dynamic um, perspective, um, the buses are um, the better vehicle to go. That's why we have focused in the first step on buses. So which kind of buses um, uh, do exist? That was uh, the first question we have raised ourselves. Um, uh, you have uh, low floor um, buses, you have um, high floor buses, you have uh, mixed intercity buses, 
with low and high floor. And that's important um, to have the right drive train. Um, so on the city buses, which are um, the types which we mainly focus on today, uh, you have low floor. That's why um, we have decided for a low floor portal axle. We have done um, our own research on, on uh, the key factors like gradability, um, especially if you go to the mountain area, which um, are very close to where I live. I'm, I'm close to Munich. Um, the power consumption is, uh, is an important thing, the price, of course, and as we talk about retrofitting, um, how easy is it to retrofit the vehicle? And um, you can see if, uh, if we take everything into consideration, um, the near wheel drive is uh, the one which we have decided to go for, and we have decided for a product from um, ZF um, in Friedrichshafen. It's um, the electric portal axle X tracks. Um, it's uh, very well known as it's in new buses um, like um, Mercedes and um, uh, Solaris as well. So it's the most used electric portal axle today on city buses. Um, you have uh, several driving functions like um, the hill creeping, hill holder. Of course, you have um, recuperation. And uh, on articulated buses, we can provide a four wheel drive. Which is um, uh, which might be an important matter for uh, for the Nordic countries like Sweden, Norway, Finland, uh, where you do have um, a lot of icy roads in in the winter. So how we move on then um, uh, on the customers, we install a telematic module, which we also purchase from um, CDF. Uh, by the way, you. You may be asked, they buy a lot of from ZF, it seems to be. Uh, we have a strategic partnership with them, which I will come to, um, to that point later. Um, so we use a telematic uh, module um, uh, to put in the existing vehicles um, to, to get a clear view about the routes they are going today, about um, uh, uphill and downhill and stops and traffic jams and uh, weather conditions and everything to make sure that we will install the right battery capacity because um, a good thing on retrofitting is that um, it can be a custom-made solution with the right battery size. Um, you should not put too much battery in if you don't need it because it's um, it's a waste of resources and a waste of money. On the battery side, um, uh, we have a, a very modular um, approach. We have developed our own battery module together with our battery supply. And um, today we use um, NMC uh, cell chemistry in our batteries, but we can use in the same modules or in the same system um, also LTO for um, high power charging or LFP. Um, for um, for more um, more cycles, um, so whatever chemistry uh, makes makes sense mostly, um, we we can use it. And um, important is that we can install up to seven hundred twenty kilowatt hours um, from a systems point of view. Today we install the battery in in the back in the former motor compartment. And um, here we have on, on the regular side, we have 270 kilowatt hours installed in buses. So the charging concept is, um, is also very, very important. Um, and um, in principle, we offer the most two important ones, um, uh, the plug charging uh, with the CCS type two um, we can go up to 350 kilowatt. Today, our standard solution uh, goes up to 120 kilowatt, which is um, far enough as we talk about an overnight charger where you don't need um, too much energy um, for overnight um, charging. On the pantograph side, um, it's, it's um, two possibilities. Uh, one, you have the pantograph on the infrastructure or on the vehicle. It's up to the customers. Um, so uh, whatever the wishes of the cities are, um, we do. The only thing which we have not investigated too much today is inductive charging. Um, as, um, as we got to know that um, most of the 
prototype projects on inductive charging were were not too positive, so um, um, the cities did not um, follow it up. Um, but anyway, if this will come in the future, uh, we're open uh, because um, from a technology point of view, we can realize um, yeah, almost everything. So how does it look like then? Um, of, of course, we have to um, exchange um, the diesel engine and, and the transmission. Uh, we have to integrate um, the new powertrain, which is the electric portal axle. Um, so we also replace the rear axle, uh, which is easy with ZF because on the city buses, about 99% of all city buses have rear axles from ZF. Um, so it's a plug and play system for us, uh, which is from a timing perspective, a time saving perspective, very good. We have to remove all auxiliary units which have been fed by the diesel engine before, uh, which is um, um, hydraulic pumps, um, uh, water pumps, uh, um, steering, um, a steering um, a pump. Um, so all these kind of things have to be electrified. And of course, heating and cooling system um, has to be electrified. Um, here we work uh, with um, um, with a heating pump technology, the newest one uh, from our supplier of Aleo today, um, where we can we can um, um, heat and and cool in in one in one module. We also have the possibility to install. Um, um, uh, a heating system which can be fed by diesel or oil. Um, most of the customers don't like it. Uh, they like to have full electric heating, which is fine for us. But some customers um, like to save batteries and have um, a combustion engine heating, uh, which is um, uh, um, fine for us as well. So um, we can provide um, too. And then of course the charging infrastructure must be must be the right one. And for us. Um, the most important thing is the vehicle control unit. That's our own product. It's the only product here, which you can see, which is our own product. But this um, VCU takes over control of the whole vehicle. It's like the brain of the vehicle. Um, so it's the most important um, uh, part. You can see it here. It, um, it controls all components like the, the converters, the batteries, drivetrain steering system, everything. And um, we have developed this vehicle control unit on the highest level of automotive standards. Um, so it's, um, it's developed according to automotive spice and according to the new functional safety um, law ISO 26262. So also from a product liability point of view, we can make sure that we have, um, we have used the highest standards. And by having developed such a basic and modular system, you can implement that system. Of course, you have to modify it a little bit. Um, in principle, in every commercial vehicle you like, you see some pictures like trucks or um, um, long distance buses, coaches. Um, uh, we, we also can uh, talk about um, 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 agriculture machines or road working machines. Um, it doesn't matter because the system in principle stays the same as the system is, um, is ruled by our uh, vehicle control unit. Then um, you see we have a cooperation together with uh, ZF. We're not only using their products on the drivetrain and tele telematic side, uh, we also use their sales power globally, and we use their service network globally. A uh, very important thing, if you retrofit um, a, a bus somewhere, the second question is um, um, what to do if um, the bus get damaged. Um, and um, here we have uh, a very well known and a very well accepted uh, service um, network from ZF globally, which we can rely on. And uh, we also use ZF as a training center for our conversion partners, for our service partners. Um, so um, that's a very important thing because our business case is a global one. Um, we start in, in Europe, um, but we see a lot of opportunities also 
in other countries like North Africa, South America, and India. Talk a little bit about numbers. It's, um, it's only um, uh, two slides to go anymore. Talk a little bit about numbers. Uh, what happens on the CO2 emission compared um, to a diesel bus today? So if you purchase a new diesel bus, Euro 6, um, the production is about 22 um, uh, tons CO2 um, for the production. If you um, have a new e-bus, you are about 43 tons um, CO2 emission, mostly because of the battery. Uh, by the way, we have considered that the battery is manufactured in China, where um, the Chinese energy um, mixture is uh, probably the worst um, um, uh, globally, um, but we didn't want to put anything to positive, so we have taken um, uh, the worst conditions. And um, the, the last, uh, the, the last uh, one here is a converted atrophied bus with 32. So how we can calculate the 32 on production? It's the difference between the diesel bus and the new electric bus. Uh, which is um, mainly um, a battery and drivetrain and all these kind of things. And we have considered half of the, um, uh, of the CO2 emission of a new diesel bus because the bus has already spent some years, so we cannot, um, uh, um, we cannot take over 100% of the CO2 emission on our, um, on our system. Nevertheless, um, it, um, didn't, it didn't make too much uh, difference because you can see that already in the first year of the 60,000 kilometers, um, the diesel bus has already emitted 120 tons, whereas a new electric bus um, emitted 46 tons and um, a retrofitted bus from, uh, from Etrofit, 35 tons. So over a time frame of 10 years, 600,000 kilometers, um, which is um, pretty close to one lifetime of, um, of the battery. Um, uh, you have a saving of 944 tons of, um, um, of CO2 emission. And that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty a lot per vehicle. So, if, um, if you would convert only 5% of the city buses in Europe, you would save annually 1.3 million tons of CO2 emission per year. And now the most important thing, um, it's even cheaper. Um, as you see here, that's on a, on a nine years calculation. Uh, the reason why is that uh, from a uh, um, financing point of view in Germany, everything's on nine years um, on, um, on, the, on the cash flow. So um, in nine years, including um, energy consumption, including diesel prices or um, 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 energy prices, you spent on a retrofitted bus um, 580,000 euros in nine years. Um, you deduct the residual value, and then uh, you have real costs of 540,000 um, um, euros for 540,000 kilometers, and nine times um, uh, 60,000. Uh, so it's, it's uh, very close to one euro per kilometer. Um, if you see here on a, um, a Citaro bus from Mercedes, which is the most sold um, a diesel bus today, the initial price is only 250,000 euros, um, but after nine years, you did spend 684, so probably um, or, or a little bit more than 100,000 euros more. Why? It's because um, uh, the maintenance costs are only half if you have electric buses, and it's because um, the power consumption. Is, um, is a lot less on the electric vehicles compared to diesel vehicles because the diesel vehicles, they have to, um, um, they have to pay higher prices um, over the next years as uh, we have um, CO2 um, additional cost um, according to our um, uh, Green Deal 
Um, so that's why um, the Interfit kit is not only from a CO2 emission point of view um, um, good for our um, for our climate. It's also good for our pocket money, <laughs> for our pocket because um, uh, you save money compared to diesel. Of course, you save uh, more money than compared to new electric bus, because, uh, but that's clear. But you also save money compared to diesel, and that's why uh, we believe um, that uh, we can help to make the change properly um, very much in in the next years. And um, yeah, we're we're open. Um, for any municipality and for every country um, across the globe um, to help to reach the goals because this is our contribution still um, uh, to help to make the change. And here you see um, two pictures of um, the first bus we have, uh, we have converted. It's an old diesel bus uh, with an age of 17 years um, being fully converted um and um yeah it's it's some more to come in the next years hopefully um so that was my last slide thank you very much for your attention and i saw that uh, we have um a lot of questions and answers so i'm more than happy to um to answer them thank you very much andreas that's a very um, nice to see the insights of uh, retrofitting buses we have indeed quite some questions popping up. Um, I will see which one we can take. Um, also, we would suggest that you maybe can answer the, the other questions offline uh, later on, uh, where possible. Okay. So, um, let me check. Do you face uh, fuel cells as um, competitive technology for buses? Um, yes, it depends on the um, the usage where you you have to do it. I think I think below two hundred fifty kilometers a day, um, the full battery um, vehicle is uh, the more attractive one. But beyond um, two hundred fifty kilometers a day. I think the fuel cell um, uh, will be will be good if um, if it is as a range extender or as a um, a, a full uh, fuel cell vehicle. I think beyond two hundred fifty kilometer, um, this technology might be uh, might be the better one. Okay, thank you. A uh, question which became very popular apparently is um, what is the weight difference between a former diesel system and the the bus with yeah. the battery system. Yeah, it's um, in our case, it's exactly 300 kilograms. 300 kilograms, okay. Yeah, um, heavier than before. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, then a bit longer question. Um, so the average consumption of an urban bus is one kilowatt hour per kilometer. Um, for 200 kilometer daily range, you will need to retrofit 200 kilowatt hour of battery, which is about 1500 kilo kilograms. But this number is, is imposed by the, the question. Yeah. Um, what would well, not be better to brand new a new EV bus? Uh, so well, it's it's more expensive. <laughs> um, we we have no impact on the chassis design, um, so we use. We, we don't do any modifications on the chassis uh, because it's, it's not needed. Um, we use the chassis as it is. And um, that's why we don't have any um, additional cost on the chassis side for old bus. Of course, you have to refurbish it. Um, you have to get rid of the corrosion and these kind of things. But that's normal after eight years or 10 years of a vehicle. So you have to do your regular service, um, service things, but we don't touch the frame or the chassis. Okay, and I have two questions which are maybe linked to each other. Um, so one is about um, do you do crash tests um, if you do retrofitting um, because the impact in, in case of a crash will be different yep. or um, which is linked to this question it's uh, it's popping up differently <laughs> um, 
I'm lost the question now. So first about the crash test and yeah, the responsibility in case of road safety related incidents, um, will it be the vehicle manufacturer or the, the retrofitter in this case? Yeah, uh, um, so coming, coming to the crash tests um, first, we don't do crash tests as we don't need to do them because we don't change um, uh, the, the framework of, um, of the vehicle. All parts we use are um, developed uh, from our suppliers to the highest standards. So for example, the batteries, uh, the batteries are um, um, ECE R100. So they are crashed and they did all the crash tests themselves. So we don't need to crash the batteries anymore. And that's uh, the same uh, for the other components. Um, when we have started this project from the very beginning, we have um, uh, cooperated with uh, the TÜV suite which um, is uh, the organization which gives the road um, license um, in Germany. And um, everything which I tell you is, uh, is what, they, um, uh, what they confirmed and told us. So no crash test um, necessary as we don't change um, the frame. The second one, Philip, was? The responsibility in case of road safety related incidents. Yeah. So everything which is related to our system um, uh, uh, it's our responsibility. So if if the bus goes um, um, makes any wrong performance and anything um, uh, or anyone got hurt, um, it's our responsibility. And that's why I've mentioned um, that we have developed on the highest level of automotive standards to make sure that um, if something happens, our product insurance company. Um, will uh, will pay for that um, if something happens um, because we did everything what we can do to make sure that um, our system is as safe as it can be. Sounds logical, but I understand the question as well. Um, question that pops up, um, it seems more practical question about the battery needs. So how big are the battery needs need to be to cope with the heating demand in cold winter conditions? Um, sorry, what was the question? How big are the battery needs to be to cope with the heating demand in cold winter conditions? So indeed, if people choose to have um, the heating system on battery supply, how much yeah. bigger the battery should be? Well, it, it depends on where the bus is used. Um, uh, let me say it differently. Um, today we have um, uh, 270 kilowatt hours um, in our bus integrated, which is about 240 kilowatt hours usable energy. And um, this energy is good enough to go 270 kilometers a day in one run. Um, if the weather conditions are like spring or autumn and it goes um, uh, 200 kilometers if we have worst conditions uh, like um, a very hot um, temperature or a very low temperature where you need a lot of heating. So it's, uh, I think it, it does not answer the question exactly um, but, um, uh, but it's better to understand that uh, the range you can go um, differs because you um, on, on the battery side um, it's um, we can go on the roof that's um, that's possible to increase the battery but first of all we would need to see if uh, our current structure would fit uh, to what the customer needs so if you are in South Europe um, like at south of Spain or if you are um, um, in, the, in North Finland um, I'm quite sure we can reach only about um, 200 kilometers where we should calculate on but if you're uh, central europe um like um belgium or um france or um germany um we can calculate up to 270. okay thank you very much um we answered already more questions and running a bit out of time in the q a thank you for your contribution and um the other questions will be try to um answer them now during the next presentation or later on. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, um, you're welcome, Philip. Shall, shall I answer these questions now? You can, if you. Okay. 
if you want to, please, and if not, we'll be later on. I try to. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So then I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Jesper Thun. Welcome. Hello. So thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thank you Andreas for a very, very good presentation, actually taking up some of the things that I will also continue a bit on. Um, I will try to share my screen. Yeah. And um, so I went into full screen mode, definitely. Do you see my screen? No, not yet. No. So it was a bit delay in the system, but not that much. Here we are. Screen is there. Just have to move it to full screen if possible. So, yeah. Full screen? Great. Okay. Please go ahead. Yes. My name is Jesper Thun. I'm from the company uh, eCap Mobility uh, with the head office in uh, Vincent. Uh, near uh, Hamburg in, in Germany. Um, ECAB is, is uh, privately owned uh, by Hüben, uh, which also have uh, some other uh, interesting companies in this regards uh, underneath. Um, we have 40 employees uh, and have uh, offices in Denmark, where I'm from, and in China. I would like just briefly to mention uh, Clean Logistics and Becker Marine uh, is one of the companies below Höpen. Um, clean Logistics uh, taking the more heavy duty uh, part of it, um, uh, which is uh, 40 tons uh, trucks, which has uh, kind of the same similarities to, to the buses, uh, heavy duty vehicles. And uh, Becker Marine Systems, which is uh, taking the um, the marine uh, part of it, uh, making a propulsion system, electric propulsion systems for, for ships. On our cooperation partners, uh, we have uh, cooperation with the uh, Refire. Uh, we are the service partner and distributor of uh, Refire fuel cells, which is used actually on the 40 tons trucks, coming a little back to what Andreas talked about. Uh, when to shift about from from a, a battery uh, only battery um, system to a kind of a hybrid system. Um, in this case, for the 40-ton trucks, the fuel cells actually giving a range of 500 kilometers, which is exactly what you need for for more on the logistics sides, uh, where where long traveling ranges are important much more than inner city, where you will probably go for a pure electric, uh, more like the buses, if, if you are in that area. Um, ECAP has a quite wide range of uh, products. Um, we only do the conversion of the vehicles but also we, we have, so we don't produce the vehicle ourselves. Um, on top, we do development uh, within a lot of sectors um, on the utility vehicles, but also on wheel loaders and uh, going into um, power banks and um, um, alternative to generators, diesel generators for remote locations, also using the fuel cells in some cases. The marine segment also has the private part of it, uh, which ECAP takes care of in, in conjunctions to, to Becker Marine, which is more on the, on the bigger ships. But more or less, we do conversions of more or less anything. Um, 
In my next slide, I would like to start off where uh, Andreas also um, touched upon is, is on the CO2 emissions and how uh, how to see that or deal with this um, and how can retrofitting or e-swapping or whatever you would like to name it uh, be a part of that solution. Um, there have been quite some uh, it almost went viral uh, in Denmark at least uh, there were some um, uh, reports uh, taking up the discussion on how environmental friendly are electric cars in a general matter um, and what it what it, it question marked on was actually well uh, we know that the internal combustion engine cars has a fairly high emission rate um, and, and electric cars of course has a lower one. Um, but what happens if you take into account what, what, what is the production of the uh, batteries actually come with in the regards of CO2 emissions? I have to mention that uh, the representations that you see on the screens are, are simple, simplified. Uh, the source behind it is the Danish report on this matter, but in principle, um, it is to show what is what is the, the thoughts and concerns around it. Um, the numbers are from, from 2018 which of course will change over time, but this is to give an idea about how this um, uh, retrofitting actually changes the way we could actually look on cars, buses, uh, trucks, et cetera, uh, on the emissions. So from various sources, there was, um, this uh, added on that that uh, the battery production uh, added on a tremendous amount of emissions when produced um, uh, which is rightfully uh, if you compare to to a new car with a new electric car then and um, co2 is not being the only uh, difficulties in the production of batteries but it's an easy way to to, um, to represent uh, what we're trying to show here. Um, production of, of a battery, of course, um, is fully dependent on how, how big a battery is. But um, the, the reports in general, whether they were from Denmark or from Germany, AD, AC from Germany also made a quite, quite uh, enhanced uh, report on this subject. Um, discussed the matter on when is an electric car cleaner than an internal combustion driven car. And uh, it, it fairly uh, to raise this question. The only problem is that it fully depend on the energy mix that you have and of course the battery size. Um, on top of that, some of the reports were, were um, accused to be fairly positive and some of the reports were accused to be really negative. Uh, the truth is something more in between because they were national dependent on the energy mix which means that in Norway, for example, you would definitely see that, that the range that the car has to drive before it actually makes uh, less uh, emissions than an um, than, uh, internal combustion engine uh, is less than, uh, for example, if in other countries like, let's say, Poland. Um, so the energy mix, the percentage of renewable energy in in your your distribution system is is uh, clearly impacting on what this is and this is why some of the reports came down to 50,000 kilometers and some of them went up to 150 kilometers before the car was actually neutral to uh, internal combustion engine driven car um, 
But the funny thing is that if you add in the car production, well, again, bigger cars will make more emissions on production than, than smaller cars, that's clear. But what you see is that um, there was this big awareness of uh, the batteries uh, being polluted uh, during production, but actually the car itself, when produced, makes exactly, more or less exactly the same, or equals at least the same emissions as the production of the battery. Um, which raises some questions on how how do we actually how do we deal with this um, uh, rate or pace that we are using our resources on this planet? Um, wouldn't it be smarter to to prolong the lifetime of a car? Um, if you look into the electric converter car, I put the the production of the car to zero maybe that's not fair maybe it has to take into account some part of the the emissions during produ uh, production and andreas also touched on this a little uh, that how, how much do we account for but nevertheless it clearly shows that that um, I, what, what i wanted to uh, to say is that that uh, the production of of the vehicle itself definitely has an impact, a quite big one, and bigger, the bigger the car, bus, truck, whatever, um, and then, then, then you might know. Um, so this is where the, the, the retrofitting or e-swapping uh, of, of cars or vehicles in general come in if we could prolong the lifetime of those vehicles and at the same time make them less uh, pollutant when, when driving around. That will be a benefit for all. So um, what cars can be converted? Well, um, the, the easy answer is anything. <laughs> anything goes. Um, but I made this this uh, slide just to show that that um, the only thing that hasn't changed much in the from from something looking more like a horse wagon to what we know as a car today, the only thing that hasn't changed is actually the motor, the engine. Anything else, or around the car, or the auxiliary function have changed um, and enhanced, for, um, but but the engine itself. We, we will take it out and replace it with something better. Um, for for conversion, some of some of the uh, things happen to to cars or evolution of the car. Uh, for example, the power steering. Uh, in some cases, we have to replace the hydraulic pump uh, with an electric one. Normally, they are driven by the the engine, the, the former engine. But in newer cars, um, actually, they are also electric, making the conversion even simpler. So it has cons and pros, um, uh, this, this uh, implementation of auxiliary functions that have been undertaken by cars in general. Just to give you an idea about what you could expect from a conversion when talking about passenger cars, uh, which is very much different than when we're talking about trucks or buses. The passenger car is, is of course, smaller and has some, uh, some limitations that you have to uh, uh, stay below. Um, but just looking on on uh, what happened during, let's say, for the yeah, since since you saw the first uh, electric cars coming in, um, and and what actually happened is that if you're talking about a conversion today, you could expect something like this in in the upper end 
and already today we are putting in 400 volt systems uh, into rebuilds uh, or e-conversions. Um, we are providing all the talk you need just as, as if it was a new car. We are limited on the kilowatt hours or the battery size in general, what we can put into an e-conversion um, compared to a, a new car that you would buy directly from factory. Um, but nevertheless, it definitely um, provides a solution for, for most customers. And just to say something a little about the batteries, um, um, that's also shifting. We are following the, the, the involvement of, of what's happening on, on every, our, every um, on the battery side, especially what we put into the cars. So uh, typically um, we would have put in NIC, uh, NMC batteries uh, as, as the power density is, is quite high, but uh, shifting more and more onto uh, uh, battery chemistry that is um, the lithium iron uh, type, which is uh, not uh, flammable and uh, actually provides a much higher degree of uh, safety. So we take in and put into our conversions every time we have something that where size and weight and price comes together so it fits into a passenger car. As soon as they will be there, we will also be ready to implement it. So on the more technical aspect side, what actually happens when, when we convert cars or passenger cars? Some things will go out, some new things will go in. Um, taking out the engine, the radiator, typically it is replaced with something smaller, uh, not necessarily, but uh, uh, typically we, we need the, the, the space for, for other uh, components, so the radiator will go out. And the exhaust system, of course, is not used anymore, and the fuel tank. And instead, we uh, put in batteries, uh, electric motor, motor controller, and uh, in general, we can call it integration or CAN bus integration with the car and the BMS system. Uh, on the BMS system, uh, just to keep it simple, I, I named it BMS, but it's actually more um, integration, BMS, CAN bus, that is uh, as a product or can be seen as a whole. Um, as it is the, the control of, of, of the battery uh, and, and, and how that is interacting with the vehicle, existing vehicle. The BMS system being the vital uh, component on, on how the battery, uh, the safety of the battery firstly, but also the lifetime of the battery uh, and, and how much you can actually use of the capacity of the batteries and et cetera. So one thing that might come to a um, surprise for some at least, um, when doing conversions, you have the, the, the option to leave in the original gearbox. Um, so when, when we don't take out the gearbox normally, but at least the customer can decide if, if, if they want to do that. Um, as it also contains the differential that is needed. Uh, we, we, in some cases, we replace the gearbox with the one gear drive, uh, having also this differential, which is needed. I put on some, some kilos or some numbers here. Uh, they are worst case, but nevertheless, to give an idea about uh, what happens to a car when you convert it, taking out something looking like 150 kilos, but putting in 300 kilos. And that is called, of course, coming from the batteries. And 
150 kilos may may not sound of much, but but seen in in relations to a car, it actually adds on two passengers. Um, I guess I also know a bit about the truck side of it, the bus side, where where the, this is this is not uh, a critical issue uh, in the same way that it is for for passenger cars, uh, because the relations between the, the car weight and the battery weight are simply different. Um, and this coming a little into the dialogue that, that we need to have with our customers when they come in with good ideas on how the range should be for their vehicle. Um, rightfully put by Andreas is also that it is really most of the time a waste of resources to put in more batteries than you actually need. Something like 50% of, uh, of all driven ranges are below 50 kilometers. So you can do much more with much less. But the physical placement of the batteries are typically in the front and in the back. Um, motor, controller, integration, and, and etc. are typically placed in the front of the car. And we use, we divide the batteries into typically two, um, meaning that we can uh, shift around the weight distribution in the car uh, to, to either match or even sometimes improve the weight, weight distribution uh, of the Phoenix car. Here are some of the technical aspects that we face when, when, when we go into a, a conversion of our, our passenger cars. Um, and the overall topic is actually safety. What happens if you, when you start to, to put in batteries into a, an electrical or a, a existing vehicle? Um, safety is our main concern, um, especially on the battery side but also the amount of, of current, meaning also the amount of torque, which is proportional to the driving fun. Um, at the same time, keeping uh, the customer's wishes for, for driving range, uh, not um, exceeding the, the actual uh, allowed load, uh, having some payload uh, also available, etc. Then a little on uh, safety and certifications. Um, what what differs a bit on on um, on the, uh, the difference between a new car and uh, a re retrofitted car or a converted car is that the regulations that you have to uphold is is um, European typically for for new cars. Um, but on, on conversions, they are typically uh, national. This also means that you cannot take a car which have been approved in, for example, Germany and imported to, let's say, Denmark and uh, expecting that they would just uh, approve it for, for road, road or road worthy. Um, but what we do see is that there is some, com some common factors or some common rules that apply also in the national rules. And they are, of course, taken from, from, uh, from the European rules on electric cars. The most, uh, the most used ones that we will uh, uh, see is the ICE uh, 10 which is um, electromagnetic compatibility, compatibility uh, IMC, and the personal safety part of uh, uh, the 100 ICE, and everything else actually goes into the regulative 13H. Uh, I will just swiftly go through the, the IMC and, and the personal safety part of it. So when we take cars, I have to look at the time, I'm sorry, just to be sure. Yeah. Um, that 
when when you convert a car, you 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 suddenly go into interacting with with the with your environment on a disturbance level. Um, so we have to test, or you have to make sure that 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 you are not disturbing your environment uh, electromechanically. And also when when charging the car it actually becomes part of the grid so also here we, we have to test for that okay, okay. There it is. then there's the r100 ic100 which is on the personal safety side um this uh, regulative actually uh, tells about uh, the requirements for the IP classes, the coloring uh, used, um, and the insulation class that you have to uphold, and so forth. So on the personal safety side, there is also a part two of of the ICE, uh, which concerns the batteries, and you actually have to put in the batteries into fire and shake them and um, quite rough uh, testing. Um, not a lot of countries uh, require these tests, um, but nevertheless we see parts of this uh, being taken into also national requirements for, uh, for retrofitting or e-swapping cars. So who can do a conversion? So there's more or less two ways you can go uh, when if if you're interested in, in, in converting a car, a passenger car. Um, there's quite a number of uh, uh, companies which provide uh, a kit. Uh, so everything is prepared. Uh, um, or you can go the direction of a turnkey uh, conversion uh, where you leave it to, to the, to the uh, uh, conversion company to actually do the full conversion. Um, which way you, you would prefer to go actually, it of course depends on, on your skills and uh, how, if, if you think this could be something for you if you go for the kits, uh, on conversion kit. Uh, but what is important is that you find uh, a company that you trust and, and actually uh, can show uh, cases from, from other conversions, uh, which uh, partly because it is about safety, personal safety, how these, these actually are, are developed. Um, but also that, that these components, um, what, uh, what is the lifetime and what is the guarantees and et cetera. So either way, if you go for the turnkey or the kit conversion that you can do yourself, uh, definitely uh, find someone that you trust and, and can actually help you on this. Uh, also, especially if you are uh, in the Northern countries, um, just find someone who can have done this before or would help you with the uh, actually uh, taking this car into roadworthiness of, of that particular country. So what kind of cars are converted? So this is what it was about how and what could be. But the reality is that um, mainly we convert cars of a uh, um, uh, older date. Um, and that is, of course, because the, 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 the value of the car represents something else than just the, the money value. It has some affections. Um, and I wrote in here, killing the, car, the soul of the car or reborn electric, uh, which is something that, that uh, really comes up to question when um, when um, when going in and then converting older cars. And I deliberately did not let this go in for a vote because there's not much logic about uh, cars in general. Why are they even in different colors? I mean, there's this is a, a, a personal uh, thing for, for our customers if they want to 
to convert or not. But definitely it, it puts on a, a question mark on that. Um, but what I can tell is that if you're driven um, a electric converted car in a classic style, so to say, um, you experience something very, very, um, et cetera, um, something very special and, um, and actually uh, can enjoy the car in a brand new way. So why do we even bother um, converting old cars? Well, it, it does give a quite um, firm statement for our customers uh, which direction they want to go and what they see for the future. So although that you will not save the planet converting some, some old cars, it, it definitely says something about uh, uh, if you believe in a in a better future, um, so um, we actually convert more or less anything, and um, have had some some quite nice cars uh, in our in our hands, um, and um, yeah, it's a silent ride. Um, emission free and it kind of shows when you're converting cars it is a challenge but also at the same time shows that anything almost anything is possible when you're converting and it could be a bridge a fast track to uh, um, environmental uh, uh, driving experience Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jesper. Um, good to have the insights of a different point of view and of retrofitting indeed everything that uh, is in our wish list. So I have quite some questions popping up. Um, yeah, let's see. <laughs> um, some are more technical, some are more about uh, legislation, uh, etc. So um, one pops up uh, very high in the ranking is um, the following question. Given that a converted car gets uh, considerably heavier and faster in acceleration than the original one, do you also upgrade the braking system in any way? If yeah. you want, do you recommend it? So um, when starting a conversion, um, this dialogue, with the customers, which is definitely needed. Um, um, you have to decide whether you want to just electrify the car, convert it one to one, or if you want to enhance it. Actually, just in electrifying it will enhance it and it will be more fun to drive. But as soon as you, you go beyond on what the former um, combustion engine would give you from, let's say, torque, uh, the considerations on on uh, on gear and uh, and definitely also braking comes in. What we see is that typically we, we keep it just below, so we don't change the brakes because the price will definitely increase when you start to touch on those parts. But okay. a possibility, yes, there is no limits. Good, thank you. Um, then few questions about homologation and legislation in the markets. Yeah. Um, so what's, uh, what about homologation of the converted vehicle? You, you answered already during your presentation, but how is the market situation in Europe for the moment? Yeah, so, so um, the conversions in general, we would like to see that, that uh, um, uh, uh, in we do also see an increasing interest for, for converting newer cars, but we have to say that, that today it is the, the, the classic cars which are in the private segment uh, what customers uh, request. Uh, did that answer or just what was the question again? So about homologation of converted vehicles. So indeed, yeah, but I think we need to see 
or to know what the situation is in, in Europe? Is it possible in, in all countries? Is it, uh, I, I know that France is, is one of the countries that announced it recently. Yeah, so, so how difficult it is to actually get uh, your car approved in the different EU countries. Yeah. Uh, and that is different, um, as it is a national uh, regulation that you have to uh, comply to. Um, what what you can do, or what we do, is that we uh, more and more um, um, actually uh, does the, the requirements for, for the European rules and thereby have a really good argument when, when coming into the different countries. But they are different and, um, and you, yeah, you should keep that in mind. But nothing is impossible. Uh, until now, it had, we have succeeded, so, um, and others too, so. Um, yeah, there's many questions that have an overlap. It's indeed about the, the braking system, um, how it works, if there is uh, an upgrade necessary for the braking system. So I think you, you have answered this question already. There is also many questions popping up about the cost price, about conversions, yeah. and what is the average cost price? What was the, the cost of the conversion of the DeLorean? <laughs> yeah, the DeLorean was quite expensive. We made three of those, uh, actually. Um, it's one of the best conversions ever done. Um, but um, yeah, the car uh, simply just um, allows you to do uh, crazy stuff, right? So, um, but let's get the elephant out. And um, a conversion is, is um, it would be something like starting price 20, 50, 25,000 euros. That would be kind of a, a starting price. Um, and the conversion of the DeLorean is, is more expensive. Actually, there was two different conversions, one which was one to one, meaning that it would uh, have the same power as before, much more fun to drive. And we also did a conversion where uh, the customer required or asked specifically for a longer range, which then again meant that we had to put on new brakes, uh, different suspension, and the price definitely went up. And I I think it was 40,000, not 100% sure, but as, as soon as you go into this, you have to test more, you have to go to a test track and on and on. So, so uh, as the more you touch, the more you change in the car, you, the more you have to test. Of course, yeah, um, seems logical. So there is also questions, um, yeah, how many passenger cars you already have converted? Um, any idea how many kilometers have been driven? Oh, good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, I, I really don't know. You don't know. That's fair. No, a lot. <laughs> a lot. You don't know everything. So, yeah. um, and one small remark here, uh, which I appreciate. So, uh, so about uh, the video, uh, the car that you showed there, the amphibic car. Um, which model is it again? Can you help it out? It's an existing car that you have. Uh, yeah, it's an previous car that, from a customer that we converted. Um, and, and it just shows that, that anything is possible, right? You have water and power and batteries and does it even fit together? And, and yes, it does. Uh, and, and it's giving a, a silent ride on, on the water uh, that, that, uh, that, yeah. You would not be without. What's, what's the name of the model? Do, do you know it? I don't remember, sorry for that. But it, uh, there's not many of those empty cars. They, they were not, people wanted a boat or a car. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a fun one. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a few more questions, but we can try to answer them uh, later on or if people have questions that are really an uh, emergency, please uh, post, them by, post an email and, and yeah. we will address them to our respective speakers. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Jesper. Um, thank you for your contribution today. 
Um, we also have uh, upcoming webinars um, in coming months. We, we continue during also July. Um, it's, and he has mentioned earlier um, inductive charging. Uh, we have on the 1st of July, the timing is not set yet, but we will talk about uh, inductive charging. Inductive charging in the roads, inductive uh, units for passenger cars, uh, how the approach is. We have updates from the European Authority Fuel Observatory with some studies and the World Electric Vehicle Journal. So that's the academic approach of, um, with studies, shares. And accordingly, the EVS updates, uh, which we are partner of. Thank you very much for today. Thank you for attending and keep in touch. Bye -bye. Thank you, Philippe. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.